Archaeothyrus is the earliest known synapsid. It lived in what is now Nova Scotia in Canada during the Carboniferous. At this time it was a swamp similar to today's Everglades in Florida. Its lifestyle would have been more or less the same as its other reptilian contemporaries. Ophiacodon is another basal synapsid and is close to the evolutionary line leading to mammals. It most likely lived on land, but paleontologists have sometimes thought that it was semi-aquatic, its the long hind limbs would not have been an effective means of propulsion. Casea lacked teeth in its lower jaw, and had blunt teeth in the upper jaw. These adaptations indicate that it was a herbivore, feeding on relatively tough plants such as ferns. Their fossils are typically found in upland environments and their anatomy would be unusual for a semi-aquatic onema. Cotylorhynchus was a heavily built animal with a disproportionately small head and a huge barrel-shaped body. It is usually considered to be the largest terrestrial vertebrates of its time. Tetraceratops would have resembled a large lizard with four horns on its snout, and a pair of large spines emanating from the corners of its jaw. The first teeth in the upper jaw were long and dagger-like. Edifosaurus was cold-blooded, so it needed the sail on its back to absorb heat during the day and slowly release it during the night. But recent research that examined the microscopic bone structure of the tall neural spines in edifosaurids has raised doubts about a thermoregulatory role for the sail and suggests that a display function is more plausible. Its teeth were so primitive, it had to depend on a lot of intestines. Which is why it was so squat, it was slow and pretty easy prey for some of the large predators of the time. The marginal dentition of Ianthosaurus is similar to that of insectivorous reptiles. Unlike Edifosaurus, it was lightly built and was probably quite agile. Sacodontosaurus is still only known from very incomplete postcranial remains, which makes further differences hard to establish. The known elements, though, are seen as being very similar to Dimetrodon. Spinacodon and Dimetrodon typically have been found in different geographical areas that were separated by the ancient Hueco Seaway that penetrated equatorial Pangaea during the early Permian and covered much of southern New Mexico and parts of West Texas. Tenospondylus was a carnivore and preyed upon animals close to its size, its spines were longer than those of Spinacodon. Because of its large size, it was probably the apex predator in its environment, and might have competed with other predators like Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon is often mistaken for a dinosaur or as a contemporary of dinosaurs in popular culture, but it became extinct some 40 million years before the first appearance of dinosaurs. Reptile-like in appearance and physiology, Dimetrodon is nevertheless more closely related to mammals than to modern reptiles, though it is not a direct ancestor of mammals. It was probably one of the apex predators, but smaller Dimetrodon species may have had different ecological roles. Its teeth lacked adaptations that would stop cracks from forming at their serrations. Eotitanosuchus was without doubt a dominant animal of its environment. Found preserved in flood deposits containing many skeletons of Astemonosuchids, it has been suggested that this large predator was an excellent swimmer, possibly semi-aquatic. Biarmosuchus would seem to represent one of the most primitive of the Biarmosuchia, and could be taken as a good generalized model for the other, mostly later forms. It was a lightly built, probably agile animal that would have fed on smaller tetrapods. Due to erosion and dorsoventral crushing, features of Bernicia's skull are hard to interpret. Stutural lines are further distorted by the unusual shape of the skull roof.
a Steminosicus had a sprawling posture indicated by analyzing its shoulder joints and its skull possessed several sets of large horns, somewhat similar to the antlers of a moose, growing upward and outward from the sides and top of the head. It has been suggested that the animal had a fairly constant internal temperature. The dinocephalians are the least advanced therapsids, although still uniquely specialized in their own way, they were among the largest animals of the Permian period. Antiosaurus was a slinking crocodile-like semi-aquatic forms, but it was probably quite able to get about on land to hunt for prey. It had a thickened skull and this has been suggested as an adaptation for head-butting behavior. Eulimosaurus is considered a herbivore, but because the mandible is heavily constructed some paleontologists consider it a carnivore, with the species being able to use muscle power to cut prey up with its incisors. Struthiocephalus fed in or near water, the teeth being used for rooting up, gathering and grasping plant matter. The bone surface around the nostril might indicate the presence of a fleshy valve present used for closing off the nostril underwater. Moschops would fill an important evolutionary niche before the arrival of the dinosaurs, making it the equivalent of evolution's bookmark, which means that it lived in much of the same way as dinosaurs that came along later. It was built low to the ground and grazed on plants like modern cows do today. It was an odd-look creature that looked like someone pasted together a whole lot of different animals and just called it moss chops. Suminia was found in sandstone sediment, so it most likely was a delta-dwelling species, but this is not conclusive, as the specimen may have been washed downriver, away from its habitat. More recently found fossils indicate that it led an arboreal lifestyle. Diectodon shared many features with modern-day mammals. Most noticeably, they made burrows into the earth, lived like the modern gopher. This small herbivorous animal was one of the most successful synapsids in the Permian period. They used their beaks to break off pieces of the sparse desert shrubs, it may have had unusually efficient digestive systems, due to the lack of nutrients present in desert plants. Cystocephalus appears to have been endemic to the Karoo Basin of South Africa, it is most common in its habitat in which it dominates the fauna. Dicynodonts first appeared during Middle Permian, and underwent a rapid evolutionary radiation, becoming the most successful and abundant land vertebrates of the late Permian. Since the genus was first named, over 160 species have been assigned to Dicynodon. This animal was toothless, except for prominent tusks. It probably cropped vegetation with a horny beak, much like a tortoise, while the tusks may have been used for digging up roots and tubers. Dicynodonts have long been suspected of being warm-blooded animals. Their bones are highly vascularized and possess haversion canals, and their bodily proportions are conducive to heat preservation. Lystrosaurus is notable for dominating southern Pangaea during the early Triassic for millions of years. At least one unidentified species of this genus survived the end Permian mass extinction. It has therefore been suggested that Lystrosaurus survived and became dominant because its burrowing lifestyle made it able to cope with an atmosphere of stale air. But for some paleontologists like Benton, perhaps the survival of Lystrosaurus was simply a matter of luck. Canmyria was well adapted to living as a herbivore, it had a powerful beak and strong jaw muscles built for shearing plant material. Although it had a large head, it was lightweight due to the size of the eye sockets and nasal cavity.
Placerias probably spent its time chewing on the grass that lived on the banks of lakes and rivers. Its short tusks probably wasn't used to procure food but was probably used as a form of protection against animals trying to attack it. It walked on four legs which were short and squat. It may have even lived like a modern hippo, spending a considerable amount of its time in water. We aren't sure just why this animal went extinct. Some paleontologists have theorized that better developed dinosaurs came along and drove them into extinction. Despite being the most species-rich group of dicynodonts in the Triassic period, Canmyriaforms exhibit much less diversity in terms of their anatomy and ecological roles than do dicynodonts from the Permian period. Ikeshigwalastia was a common member of the local fauna, although not as abundant as the medium-sized herbivores Hyperodipedon. The only danger to such a huge animal was the almost equally large carnivorous Pseudosuchian saurosicus. About the size of an elephant and weighing an estimated 9 tons, Lysoesia is the largest known non-dinosaurian terrestrial tetrapod from the Triassic and the youngest definitive member of the group. Gorgonopsians evolved in the Middle Permian, from a reptile like the rhapsid that also lived in that period. The early species were small, being no larger than a dog. The extinction of dinocephalians led to Gorgonopsids becoming the apex predators of the late Permian. Gorgonops itself was a medium-sized representative of the group. Aside from the teeth, one of the key predatory advantages that it had over prey were that the legs supported the body from below and would have allowed for a much faster pace. Lysenops also walked and ran with its long legs held close to its body. This is a feature found in mammals. The ability to move like a mammal would have given Lysenops an advantage over other land vertebrates, since it would have been able to outrun them. Inostronchavia is known from several skulls and two almost complete skeletons. It was the largest Gorgonopsids known. It shared its habitat with Scutosaurus, which it likely preyed upon with its saber tooth like canines. Its body was slender, with rather short legs. Proconosicus is considered to be one of the earliest and most basal cynodonts. It has many primitive features, but it also has features that distinguish it from all other early therapsids. Some of these features have been interpreted as adaptations for a semi-aquatic lifestyle. Thrinaxodon adopted a semi-sprawling posture, an intermediary form between the sprawling position of pelicosaurs and the more upright posture present in current mammals. It is prevalent in the fossil record in part because it was one of the few carnivores of its time. The lack of ribs in the Cynognathus stomach region suggests the presence of an efficient diaphragm, an important muscle for mammalian breathing. It was a heavily built animal with a particularly large head. Marks in the upper and lower jaw of cynodonts have been interpreted as channels that supplied blood vessels and nerves to whiskers. Exertodon was an herbivore with a specialized grinding action when feeding. An analysis of the size of the bones of calves collected in Paleoroda concluded that the mother Exertodon had one or two calves, for one pregnancy. Probanognathus was a species of small, carnivorous cynodonts which possessed features that provide a connection between cynodonts and mammals. 
The jaw joint articulation development is an important step in the evolution of mammals as this squamosal dentary articulation is the joint all extant mammals possess. These findings provide evidence that probanognathus and oligochyphus should be placed on the line ascending towards mammalia. Tritalodon shared a lot of characteristics with mammals, and were once considered mammals because of overall skeleton construction, it is now regarded as non-mammalian synapsids. Bienotherium is defined as being big and robust compared to other tritalodonts, and also by exposed maxillaries in the skull, an unusually long diastema and thin zygomatic bone. The dentition of synoconodons can be arranged in a series of increasing lengths. The combination of basal tetrapod and mammalian features makes it a unique transitional species. There are simply no animals like it alive today. Atelobacillus is also a transitional form in the character transformation from cynodonts to Triassic mammals. For this reason, it is thought to be the common ancestor of all modern mammals or a close relative of the common ancestor. Castoricauda was highly specialized, with adaptations evolved convergently with those of modern semi-aquatic mammals such as beavers. The tail was broad with scales interspersed with hairs that grew less frequent toward the tip. These early mammals developed many traits which were to make them well suited for a very active lifestyle. They relied on the food they ate to help sustain their body temperature rather than depending on their surrounding environment. The logics of phylogenetic bracketing would make Megazostrodon and Morganocodon nocturnals and burrowing too, they probably lived in forested area. <laughs>